Welcome inside the Paris Sea Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you so much for making us part of your day today. And this is KEVT, Sour Rita Tucson, AM 1210. My show revolves around the four L's, leadership, love, life, and lineage, and the ongoing story of real music made by real artists. Just this past week, a buddy of mine gave me a snare drum and a tambourine. I get to go home and play that drum to music, good or bad. For a few seconds, or maybe a minute, I begin to dance. Eyes closed in my head, knowing that if I start to think about hang-ups, that it's rhythm interrupted. Still, I hold on to that previous time and get a little taste of how special being a master professional drummer truly is. My guest today was born in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where my parents met while in school in the late 60s. He plugged into transcendent music, immediately connecting with the guru Sri Chimnoy and Mahavishnu John McLaughlin. He played in an orchestra where dynamics were an essential component to the raging apocalyptic forces ricocheting all around. To stay focused on the dance with Will Lee and Whitney Houston, because it seldom turns out the way it does in the song. My guest has tremendous technique, but needed to seek peace in his mind to feel the music. He didn't pay to play or learn music in academia. He burns till this day, making seminal soundtracks for movies and cultivating one of the headiest music operations in the world, Tarpan Studios. But he has also played music at a time when music itself has undergone a transformation from the human to an over-reliance on the digital. He has played music when bands could stay together and hone their spiritual sound to the branding of just one individual. From one or two week engagements to a night here and a night there, a night everywhere. As in life, things are constantly changing. Hopefully, the heart stays true. Narda Michael Walden, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, man. It's so good to talk to you, man. And the heart stays true. The heart's got to stay true, man, you know, and that's that's something that, that can get shrouded sometimes. But, um, you know, Nard, I wanted to ask you, um, just off the top, uh, you know, I, in the last paragraph there, I addressed some of the contemporary things that are going on within music. And I, you, you've had so much success throughout your career, but do you, do, you, do you agree with my sentiment that there's an over-reliance on digitization in music today? I understand what you're saying. And yes, uh, it can be a crutch because we can, we have tools that make it easier to do certain things, you could say, editing and tuning and things like that. But we've always tuned things, we've always made things sound what they needed to sound like in, in, in the recording studio because that's what studios are for. But yes, uh, auto-tune and uh, devices like that uh, can make it easier for a person who, who wouldn't normally have a career be able to have a career. So, having said that, um, the ante is up on everyone and everything um, to bring your best foot forward. And um, I believe that the, the song is a star and talent rules, and we have just, you know, keep our nose to the grindstone, and uh, God's grace shines brightly. Well, okay, so let me ask you something, because, um, you know, like you said, there's, there's, 
there's things now you can fix people's voices. I mean, I, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at is you. I look at you, you know, when you were first coming on the scene and you, you were forging the feel and the technique and, and it was no joke. It was, it, you really could play. And, that's right. And, 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 and I, you know, okay, I'm, 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 I think it's great that people are making livelihoods, but there's something a little bit sterile or maybe just, uh, I mean, it's not the real person right now. You, well, you can make I think it. what it is, bro, I mean, to be honest, most of the things you're hearing in the top 10 and top 20 on ra on normal radio, it's all machines. It's, 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 it's all machines. And that's become the desired sound. Uh, with the, the, our, our consumers have gotten used to it. And then not only that, when the music has become like compressed digitally, computerized on MP3, there, it's all squashed. Everything is like squashed. So then, then every artist wants their song to be as loud as the next person's song. And then so all the air gets squashed out of it. And then if you look at it on the screen, everything ends, ends up looking like a brick. So and back when vinyl came down, when we had, you know, you know more air in the music and, uh, and tape and all that, it just sounded sweeter. Uh, it wasn't coming at you so harsh and, uh, and, and like a brick. And, and we, yes, we use machines, but we also mix them live playing in with the machines. Nowadays, it's almost all machine beyond, you know, a vocal, and then even that can be so machinized. So, you know, it, it, it's just it's the times have changed, and I, but, but I always remind myself how important something that Stevie Wonder told him. He said it's very important to stay current. Right. So I have to remind myself what planet I'm on. You know, this is Earth, <laughs> and, what's, and what's Earth doing? And if I want to be hot... I gotta be down with Earth. So <laughs> yeah, right. That's how I feel about it. Well, no, I mean, as long as you're, as long as you're mixing it, you're, you're taking some of the ideals from, uh, well, like for instance, I can't remember her name, but Dion Warwick's uh, uh, family, the, the 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 woman you're working with, on, Cheyenne Elliott. Yes, like I mean, do you try to uh, uh, stay current, but also use things that you grew up on as well? Uh, Always. In in working with Cheyenne, it was such a great treat for me because. Dion Warwick and Burt Backrack and Hal David, the early music is seminal in my life to know how to, you know, hear chord changes in, in a beautiful melody, I mean a heart-touching melody. And Burt Backrack's chord changes are just ever, ever on my heart. So in working with a person like Cheyenne, I'm very much aware of being able to reach back and touch my heart, you know, with her beautiful voice. And then bring it forward in the, in the production value that it sounds you know current, but the actual song itself can have strains of what I loved in the '60s and the B sides of Dion stuff. You know, you'll never get to heaven. Anyone who had heart, all those beautiful songs are just just so classic to me. So you know. Yeah. No. I mean, I love. I I just part of the breakthrough in music that was occurring when you were first coming on the scene had to do with the idea that uh, people were saying, "Well, I'm going to do my own thing." As opposed to creating product that people can pat, that are is okay for their palates today. I just what I'm trying to get at is with with talent when when somebody comes your way, cross paths with you, um, if they've only if they're 20, 20 years old and they've only been raised with digital music, how do you try to get them to listen to space with? I just would like the Narda Michael Wal Walden way of 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 teaching cats how to how to create space in their music, how to listen for space because. All it really is now is this pulsating, it seems to me to be more sound than anything else, or noise, mm. I don't know. Well, each case is different, you know, that's what I love about, about you know, artistry. Each artist that comes to our door, comes, comes to our pan, and who I haven't had a chance to work with, I, I really look at myself like I'm Angelo Dundee, like the coach from, from Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and, you know, you, can, you couldn't tell the, the champ, jab more. You know, he wouldn't like that. So what you say is, hey, champ, your jab looks great today. And then the champ would say, yeah, it does look good, doesn't it? And then he started jabbing a whole lot. So I realized each person I work with needs a different bag of skills from me to get their, their best out, either by pushing them more or by not pushing them. Could you give an example? Yep. Mariah Carey was so hard on herself. You know, but yeah, if you heard the work we were doing and, you know, I don't want to cry, those vocals and... Vision of Love was gorgeous, of course, and, you know, she, but yet to her, you know, I, she said, I can make everything sound so much better, because it was just like, it wasn't, it wasn't good enough for her, but if, if you heard those things, you'd be like, my God. <laughs> so then you realize you had to be really light with her. You couldn't be, you know, you couldn't be pushy. 
And uh, look at Aretha Franklin and Whitney Houston. That school is very much so uh, loving the sound that comes out, loving everything about what comes out, just smiling about, you know, when they hear the big speakers with the playbacks, they just laugh and smile and, and just are embracing. So I, le- I learn a whole different way of thinking when I'm with them. Right. So, yeah, everybody, everyone's different, you know. Uh, everyone, everyone's different. Talking to Nard and Michael Walden and... Um... I wanted to go back for a minute here and, uh, I, I, you know, can you talk a little bit about uh, how long you, you stayed in Kalamazoo and then ultimately maybe um, the, the first transcendent uh, musical experience that you had uh, either, you know, going to see somebody or, I mean, you know, or, or in fact in your playing career when you, when, when you left your physical body? Wow. Okay. Okay. Well, I got to be honest. Because uh, it's a big question here. I left my physical body during Christmas Day, <laughs> uh, about maybe four years old and five years old, right and six on. years old and seven <laughs> years old. Those 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 concurrent years, my father, mother, and grandparents were so kind to me that would get me what's called the Toyland drum set, and the heads were made of paper. The head the drums would only last maybe twenty minutes because you bang on them, and then the heads would break. Right. <laughs> but that would be orgasmic to me to break those heads and play those little drums. So that's I was leaving my body at that time, and my, my parents would just sit on the couch and watch that happen. And I remember that to this day, and even to this day, when I play drums, that same feeling comes over me. So that I have to say is, was, was when I first remembered that that kind of feeling. And then who inspired me? Uh, little Richard, when I heard his '78 of you know uh, Long Tall Sally and and, and Lucille. And then Ray Charles, the live album, uh, with what I say and, and all of his live stuff he was doing. And then, of course, when I saw Stevie Wonder live in, in Chicago at the, at the Regal Theater doing Fingertips live, I just, I just I couldn't believe that there was a 12-year-old kid, I'm, I'm 10, he's 12, that had such mastery and command of his instrument, voice, and the stage. The girls were screaming, and yet he had them in the palm of his hand, breaking the band down, building the band back up, breaking the band back down, the way he moved his body. It was just such a competition for me that how am I ever going to match this? Right. right. So, oh. And I thought, well, if I'm blind, uh, maybe that's the way to go. So I went <laughs> outside and stared at that eclipse yeah. uh, and, this, and trying to make myself blind, but the Lord didn't do want, didn't no, want to take no, my no, sight. No, never, but never. I thought blind cats had the edge. Ray Charles, Stevie, George Sharing. They all had the edge, man. Well, there were though. You're right, you, and there were some more too. That really heavy guys that, without you know, uh, Rossan, Roland, Kirk. Uh, yep. You know, there there were cats that, like, not having that primary uh, medium of vision, uh, just the sound was just it was was just amazing. That and 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 their and their competence. I mean, I never saw them. I was born in '78, you know. But it's like the idea that you, who was 12 years old when you were 10 years old. I miss that. Stevie, Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder was twelve. Yeah, singing fingertips. Holy cow! And where? Did, and what? What was the? You saw him in Kalamazoo? No, at the at the Regal Theater in Chicago. Oh my! God. I mean, and just to see him walk on the stage because it was a smash at that time. All the girls just leapt to the their feet and screamed like Beatles type of screaming. <laughs> and as he walked very kind of slowly to the microphone, the way he does. I mean, just even to watch him walk on the stage was like just time stood still for me. So you got to understand, this is someone that. When you say who's more influences, or you know, you experience these highlights in your life, that was certainly one of them for me. You know, also I must yeah. say, going forward, yeah. watching Billy Cobham play drums with John McLaughlin, my vision orchestra, in Danbury or Hartford, Connecticut, after the release of the Birds of Fire album, yes, that was also time stopping for me. The whole audience was just like in shock. We saw Billy and John go at it for what must seem like maybe 15, 20 minutes in some very strange odd meter, but stop on a dime together and then take off again and just do these effortless things. And I, I was just, I said, they, this cannot be memorized. It's just it's going on too long. <laughs> and I went up to the lip of the stage and look up in John's eyes. I see his eyes roll back in his head. Wow. And, the, and like bullets coming out of the amplifier, his notes. And Billy's just at it. And I just realized this is a whole other planet, a whole other league. And I told John McLaughlin that night backstage, I said, please, I want to be able to do what I see you do. And he said, well, it's because of my prayer life, my meditation life with my guru that's really helping me. I said, I, I know I'm reading on the back of your albums these poems by Sri Chin Moy. So then not long later, he called me and I, I met his guru and I became a disciple and that changed my whole life again. Yeah, I don't want to rush through this at all. I, I, so you're, you, the album you're talking about is Love's, Devotion, surrender. 
No, it was called Birds of Fire. It was Birds of Fire. So he had poems from Sri Chimnoy on that. Okay, but I want you know I, I got to go back to something because this is this is why I do this show. Okay. You, you look up Narda Michael Walden. Everything starts with the fact that you you, you found your guru and you joined Mahavishnu. I want to know the band in the late '60s, the instrumentation of the band that you were playing in in the Midwest or wherever you were at. Break that down. Well, there are a few. My first band, I gotta, I gotta just go through it quickly. My first band was called The Ambassadors with a cat named Joel Brooks on organ. We played his uncle's bar, and that was pivotal. Then I had, I had a band called Avatar, a horn band in Kalamazoo, which was pivotal. That played Chicago type of sound. Then I, I moved to, to I joined a band called Deacon Williams and the Soul Revival on a bus tour out to California playing the funk, Sly and the Family Stone. These are white boys playing the funk, so they got in all the good clubs across America. <laughs> that was that was intense. I, I know uh, you 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 are you're you're flying right now. Here, go back to the the organ cat. You were playing in an organ trio. Yeah, no, it was, it was a trio. It was just the two of us. I played the drums, of course. Oh, it was he a duo. Organ. It was a duo. Yeah, and uh, and his father. Uh, Joel Brooks Sr. made us play over and over again this song called uh, After Hours. And After Hours was a very slow blues. You couldn't do anything but just stay on a very slow blues. But it taught you, taught me, at you know very tender age of 11 and 12 years old as I was, that I had to just be able to really focus on a very slow tempo and just really make a person feel something at a very slow tempo oh. over and over again. So that was my early on learning lesson. I, I just love the fact that because those duos were very trendy. I mean, I mean, were you playing like? Uh, can you talk a little bit about the? At, were, were you playing like? Uh, would the club like open up at six in the morning and you were playing, or you know? Uh, no, the club we would go in. Um, we'd be like an opening act. Um, if Jimmy McGuire, Jimmy, I'm sorry, Jimmy McGriff or Jimmy Smith was coming through town, wow, you know, then we would open for them. And it'd be, and because we, we, their uncle owned the club, we could get in there. And we'd play, I don't know, like six or seven, maybe eight o'clock, and then do our, do our thing and then get out. But to be in there with those people that just had the, 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 the working man class atmosphere and a small kind of type of situation, it just brought the best out in all of us to just know how to really feel our music and just taught us more than I can ever say. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm so fascinated talking to someone like yourself who just. It's about feel. I mean, I'm 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 yeah. so into feel, and I yeah. I watch you. You know, I've, I've never seen you play live or anything, but you can just see the. I mean, it almost it, it's it's you're constantly uh, 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 transcending. I was talking to this with my with my guest before, who never did any any type of psychedelics or drugs like that, and he and you know he still was able to transcend. Billy Cobb was the same way. Lenny White was the mm -hmm. same way. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, it's it to me, it's like. Uh, uh, did you did you have experiences with psychedelics and 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 did did that help your music? Uh, did it help you transcend, or did you realize at a certain point you wanted to find, as John did, because I talked to John about it quite a bit, how he wanted to get off hard drugs, and so that's mm. really why he found this Eastern spirituality, eventually finding his guru, and then really you know becoming somebody who could on a daily basis, as you saw him in in, in Danbury or whatever, he could consistently transcend and not have his consciousness altered. Mm -hmm. well, that's what where prayer life, meditation life uh, brought, to his, brought to him, just soaring uh, and, and pure. So God bless his heart. Uh, he's, my, he's my cat. I would say uh, I like smoking a little grass, you know, back at that time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did some acid, you know, some window pane, and it was, I had a very enlightening experience. In fact, I wrote a symphony based upon that experience. Uh, the symphony's called the Enchanted, the Enchanted Forest, but the experience was when I was about maybe maybe 18 years old in Pasadena. I looked at this tree and I heard the birds singing, and everything was so crystal clear. And then I got very sad, thinking that it wouldn't be that crystal clear without that experience I was having. But then the Lord told me in this experience, "No, you'll be able to have this experience whenever you want it. Now that you've seen this, now you experience this. I want you to feel this every way, every day in your life." And so that was what I was able to take away from that experience was after seeing it, I can, I can pretend it, I can feel it when I, whenever I want to. And that's another thing I learned from, my, from our guru, that inspiration is here with us 24 hours 7, like birds flying in the sky. You reach up and you can grab the bird and bring down the, the bird of inspiration at any moment. So it's our, it's our birthright. 
And that's what I love about our, our lives. Uh, just, that we can, we can so, turn on uh, at, at will. It's, it's, us, it's up to us. This is why I do the show. I mean, this is exactly, and I, I think that, that uh, so like, I mean, that was, you would say that was, you, you, this, uh, this symphony you wrote, I mean, how did that, did that come in piecemeal, or did you write that while you were also tripping? No. I was commissioned about maybe four years ago from Maestro Michael Morgan here in Oakland Symphony to write a symphony, and I sat at my piano, and it just all came out. I just thought I wanted to write about that experience I had, and it all came out. And the, my, my, my tape machine uh, wasn't getting the whole thing, so I had to redo, the, redo it all again, it just, and it all came out again. It was just a gift from God. It was absolutely a gift from God. I just channeled the Lord, and, and it all came out. Seven movements. Were you? And, um, yeah. No, were you? I, I'm, I'm curious about the, uh, you know, the when Jimmy Smith would roll through town. Were you getting off on guys like Donald Duck Bailey? Who were the drummers that you got a chance to at least see, you know, and, and see how patient they were just playing simple blues? Well, although I didn't see this 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 one drummer draft, I got to mention is this Art Blakey. Mm-hmm. It was a piece that Art Blakey had done that was a big inspiration to me called The Sermon with Jimmy Smith. It's a, it's a piece of music that's about 20 minutes, 22 minutes long. And it was showing me that you could take jazz and make it rock and roll by putting a backbeat on jazz, which at this time was really pivotal because jazz was jazz and rock was rock. Or, But... The fact that you could play jing, kink, jing, kink, jing, kink, jing, kink, jing, for a whole record, maybe minus a couple of drum fills like ba da bang, right. kink, jing, kink, jing, with Jimmy Smith playing with all this stuff and then the sax, the trumpet, Donald Donald Bird, all these cats, cats playing their different solos on top of that groove, it showed me that you can really drive a thing hard. And that's Art Blakey. Although I never saw him live, that piece was pivotal to teach me that, you know. You can really push some hardcore, man, oh, and, uh, I, and I and I, I had to speak on. Then I had to. Oh, I was going to speak on another guy who I, I, I never really saw, but young in my life, pivotal is uh, with with Horace Silver's Six Pieces of Silver Senior Blues. Lewis Hayes was 18 years old out of Detroit, Michigan. Oh yeah, and what he did, I I, I just fell in love with. So. There, there, there's a few cats I mentioned that I didn't, didn't see live, but they really became a big part of what I, what I love. Then I have to jump to Jimi Hendrix with Mitch, Mitch Mitchell with Purple Haze. <laughs> that, that was phenomenal. Then I have to jump over to Ringo Starr and his charisma on the stage with Ed Sullivan. How charismatic he was flirting with the babes up on the, in, the, in the balcony while he's playing his drums. That's pivotal. I have a lot of pivotal moments on drums. Do you, uh, you know, what's interesting is you talk about Lewis Hayes and, and Blakey. I mean, there was no, uh, I mean, you didn't learn jazz in the, in, in, in the four walls of academia. So, I mean, these guys were creating subgenres just organically. Is that fair to say? Yes, and it's fair to say that the best teachers in the world are records. I learned so much by just listening early on in my life to the great records and absorbing records that... Which ones? All of all of these things I've been, I've been mentioning to you, you know, mm-hmm. Nina Simone live, Ray Charles live, Horace Silver, Six Pieces of, of Silver. I mean, all these things. Jimmy Smith, the, the the sermon. They just taught me so much. With Dave Brubeck, you know, with the Take Five and Cannibal Adley, Seven Miles High with with Joe Zawinul. Just so much music, you know, that we could listen to and absorb. They're our greatest teachers. Uh, let's, uh, we have a, a, uh, a game on this program called Name That Tune. Uh, I think you're going to know the tune, but, uh, let's just settle in for a couple minutes and, uh, and take a listen to this and we'll come back. Okay. What if I don't know it? Maybe, maybe you do. Maybe you don't. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Welcome back inside the studios of KEVT, being transported from one planet to the other. Uh, go ahead. What, what do you got, Brother Nardo? What do you, what do you think that is? Well, this is uh, the Mavish Orchestra with myself playing the drum with the great Mavish New and uh, Ralph Armstrong, Gail Moran, and Bob Knapp on that cowbell over there. Mm, and it's a jam session that we got into, which I believe could be the song Vision is a Naked Sword, but uh, I couldn't be, be for sure, but it's definitely a jam that we're making off that kind of theme in, live... in the time zone 11. The, wow, that well, you nailed it. <laughs> well done. Um, the uh, that was I don't know the name of the tune, but 1974 from the Montro Jazz Festival. I mean, it was a live show, and just to the I know that you talked about uh, being seeing Billy with with John, mm-hmm. but I want to go back to Nardo Michael Walden. Prior to that, were, can you say uh, that you? Were you, were you were you was there some angst in your life? I mean, you were young. You were like really young, and and I'm trying to like. Did you need to find peace in order to play that kind of you in, in order to find in order to play that kind of music? Yes, I was raised very um, strict. My father was very intense, genius and intense, like a drill sergeant, and um, my mom, of course, very sweet and very sensitive. Uh, and her father, he was also like a custodian and very tough to get things right. So I, I had a lot of discipline around me. I recall leaving home when I was about 16 years old, just like so I could kind of go out on my own way and find my own way. And I worked in a, a sanitarium where I took care of children and, and also worked in the, in the seclusion wards. Wow. And all this put a lot, a lot of intensity in me. I always played very hard on the drums to kind of release uh, tension in my life. And I understood early on that, you know, uh, I could cry the music out on my drums and my and my keyboards. I could cry it out and then feel better. So I understood that kind of use of angst early on in my life. And then just before joining the Mavish Orchestra, I was with a band called the New Maguire's Sisters, and they came out of Florida. And they were on that same cutting edge of doing this type of music, different time zones, and playing furious oh. and intense. So I've always been that way as far as music, you know, hitting hard and experimenting and going beyond the downbeats and just whatever I could could get into to kind of fly out there. So this is so I mean, I and as far as you're listening, you've always had the ability to listen because the call and response. I mean, like you talked about when you saw Mahavishnu before you joined them, uh, it was was electric. But I mean, just to see the 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 dialogue and the sheer force and speed at which you guys are communicating i mean have you was there ever do, i mean what how do you feel you grew when you joined mahavishnu well that's that's that was the beauty and compassion of, of mahavishnu john mclaughlin when i was at, was asked to join the band the christmas of 73 and then we got together in january of 74 he said i would teach you and he came to the basement where we lived where i lived and we would just go at it in seven in nine and eleven Five, thirteen, mm. and he would teach me the shapes of these different time zones, and how to go without always hitting the one, and then how to play cat and mouse. And he would, and the main thing with him was listen. And he would scold me sometimes by saying, "You don't listen enough." So I had to really, really, really do my eff- my ever ever best to hear every little nuance he would play. And then that what you played that little section is that attempt of trying to just be on his wavelength, which could be enormously powerful and ripping right down to a silence. Mm. And I also realized that when he got out there, his body would begin to rock. And if his body began to rock back and forth slowly, then he was there. And then at that time, I could, it didn't really matter too much what I would play because he'd be in his zone. <laughs> I could kick it or I could lay back. He would be there. So my whole thing in life, playing with my Vishnu and to be successful, was to give him what he needed to get to get that rock on. When that rock started happening, it was it was on, brother. Oh my! Yep. Yeah, the rock. Yeah, when, so that when he started this to rock back and forth, yes. Narda could just fly away and and absolutely. At that time, it was just okay, fine. You reached you reached the uh, the pinnacle. Did, um, it might. I just want to get from your point of view, uh, one of the things I brought up, um, aside, not just the over-reliance on digitization, just the idea that with the, was it the McGuire sisters? Is that what you said? Yeah, okay. the new McGuire sisters. New, I, I mean, I, it was kind of a, a, a play on words because we weren't 
McGuire Sisters at all. No. We were a funky fusion, great band with a guitar player named Sandy Tirano. Now you're gonna have to send me some of those. Uh... And then eventually we got Rob Armstrong from Detroit on bass. So oh. it was a phenomenal group. Here's the question though: When yeah. you so you get on with a major tour, a major act like Mahavishnu, mm -hmm. and, and you're traveling, uh, you know, you get to spend one, maybe two weeks at a time in the same venue in the same city, uh, and you get to start knowing the people, and you start to create this spiritual vibe, and you, the band gets tighter live on stage, whereas now. You might go out with with uh, Jeff Beck or something like that, and maybe it's 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 twenty gigs in twenty nights. And I, well, that's and I, how it was I, with Mavishna too, if I'm honest. Really, it was I mean, it was touring yeah. very quickly. Did, okay, I mean, so go back go back to when just spending like I mean, if uh, Kalamazoo's not a great example, but I mean Jimmy Smith and Kenny Burrell. I mean, if they went to Detroit or San Francisco, th they might be playing there for a week or two weeks. And right, you, I understand you, that, you know, but with Bob Vision Orchestra, it was not that. We lived in New York so we could practice in New York and play in New York as far as practicing and really tearing things apart. But, but a tour was just like a Jeff Beck tour. It'd be playing one night here, packing up, going over to Boston, going to Buffalo, going here, going there. It was never like one place to, set, to settle down. Interesting. It was always, always on the move. I mean, you could fly to Australia and open the, I remember we opened the Opera House. The first band to play in the opera house was brand spanking new in Sydney. Then go on someplace else. So it was always moving. Did you ever play in a band where you did have one, you know, one or two week engagements? Yes, on? that was with a band called Deacon Williams and the Soul Revival. We played Blue Rock, Illinois, and you just and you stationed there for for like you know three weeks. Can you talk about how it, that lent itself to not just creating identities for the musicians, but also with the idea that the listeners you'd see the same listeners coming every night, and the idea that. That's how branding occurred in a very organic fashion. Yeah. And actually the intimacy, because you get off as much on the audience as you do on the players. I mean, that is, that's the fleeting part of where we're at today. I know we got to keep up with the times, but it seems yeah. to me like these one night stands, mm -hmm. you get all that energy, but there's something about playing for a week. You know, I get to see Narda with, uh, with, uh, you know, I forget the band now. I can't remember the band, but the, the band that you were, that you were stationed in, in Illinois with. Right. You oh, see him for a, yeah, you see him a month, a month, a yeah, month. Yeah, I mean, are you thing. kidding it was, me? It was a, we were, you know, a road band, but we would stay in places for at least two, three weeks sometimes. So I understand what you're asking. People would come every night to come and see you, and it would grow. It would be organic. It'd be it would grow, and you'd get right. better and better and better. And um, I mean, I understand that feeling. I mean, I was also in, in Los Angeles on the on the Sunset at one of those bars. I was stationed and he play for like, you know, months at, a, at the same club and, and then, you know, get, get to know the, you know, the audience and you get better and better and better. And it's beautiful. I understand what, you, what, what you're asking. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it's, 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 it's a great discipline to be able to show up at a, a, a certain venue, not having to always break your things down. And then you can, you can rely upon a good sound, which is critical for a cat like myself where I want to hear really well. And you can dial it in, then you you ready to go every night. It's it's a wonderful thing. Right. I just feel like also uh, when you look back, you you've mentioned already. You've mentioned guys like Blakey, and you mentioned guys like uh, you know uh, Jimmy coming in, or even uh, you know just so many. Mahav, you know Mahavishnu is another example. The, 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 their identities were created by not just relentless touring, but 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 staying in these urban centers or region, you know, all over the world for long periods of time where the spiritual music could be created. And so that's all I'm searching for is, I guess my overarching question is, did you, Sly Stone, The Grateful Dead, uh, you can go through the Allman Brothers, there's so many, and I'm not even doing justice to like the jazz bands, Woody Shaw, those guys. You know, the bands were able to stay together for a long time. And mm -hmm. you moved into a lot of production, a lot of movies and soundtracks and films, did, did you, was there a noticeable time in your career when you realized that music was shifting from, you know, bands that could stay together to it being almost fiscally impossible and it turning into more of the individual one on, you know, becoming a central theme and then the touring days of, of or bands staying together was kind of over? I understand. See, you have to understand from my side that touring was always looked upon as being expensive. I mean, when Mavish Orchestra toured with Jeff Beck, Jeff Beck carried with him Bernard Purdy on drums, and, and then Mavish Orchestra had 11 pieces, and we'd be flying on, you know, it, you know uh, rented planes and all that kind of thing, and it was expensive to tour. 
And I think it still is expensive to tour. So it's always like get in and get out kind of vibe. But for me, I was with my Vision Record Orchestra for two and a half years. That period of making three albums, Apocalypse, Vision of, Vision of the Animal Beyond, and Inner Worlds, just being able to be around my, my Vision or John McLaughlin for that kind of time was such a great learning experience for me. That's how I look at the, all that. Not just playing a live show, but just being able to be around him to seep in his magic yeah. and what he would be listening to in his car. All that kind of thing was really pivotal for my life. What was he listening to? We would drive around his BMW and listen to Band of Gypsies, Jimmy, Billy, Buddy Miles, and it. Billy Cox. I love it. I freak. And what else? I mean, uh, go, go. Uh, Bar Talk. He was a big, big fan of Bar Talk. Mm -hmm. We go and also see Bar Talk, uh, um, uh, you know, at, the, at Carnegie Hall. We would go see The Who when they came to town. With Pete. He was a fan of Pete Townsend. Uh, of course, uh, Keith was no, was no longer living, but... Uh, did, but you get, did you get to did you get to hang with Miles at that time? No, or? I never did meet Miles. Although I knew Miles heard about me, but I never actually met him. So um, that's one of the great the great giants I, I, I didn't I didn't meet. John, but, John but I knew yeah. great stories about him. Yeah, and I knew how pivotal he was for Mavishnu. And I know the album called In a Silent Way was a great challenge for Mavishnu because. Miles told him on this great piece composed by Joe Zawinul in a silent way. He told John McLaughlin, he said, play it as if you are a beginner, an absolute beginner. And John did. And that's the beauty of that piece. So Miles was always instrumental in getting what he needed out of those great players. What do you, what do you, can, if, you know, could you talk uh, just about, uh, the magical qualities of McLaughlin. I did two interviews with him. I found him to be just a genuinely beautiful, warm person, and he really got a kick out of me, obviously. And and but the fact that you got to really uh, engage on that level for for a few years, and then also uh, just the the seeming humbleness that he had. I just it's some can you? I guess for younger cats who are who are leaders of bands or trying to be their own person. What are some of the intangible leadership qualities that you learned from him? Well, he's mind-blowing. You, you've chosen someone to talk about here who's not like anyone, who's probably the, the, the baddest cat that we've all you know, had the chance to live and enjoy the sound of his, of his work. He's, he's incredible. I mean, he's a living genius, if you ask me. He's a truly living genius. And so just, I can say like... I can say, like, he came to where I was playing and where I was living. And in the morning, we had a meditation together in my little cabin. And on the wooden floor of my cabin, we're, we're praying together and meditating. I'm trying my best to, to just, you know, meditate with him. And I hear a sound of what I think is a faucet leaking, just kind of a drip sound. And I'm just, now I'm concerned that this drip sound is going to disrupt it. My, John McLaughlin. Then I see about 20 minutes later, John go down to the, to the ground to kind of bow, and I emulate him and go down, and when I come back up, he looks at me, and I look at him, and I bow. Then I see what's been going on. His whole face is full of tears. It was the sound of his tears hitting the wooden floor that I thought was a faucet left on. Oh, my. Oh. That's the kind of sex stuff that I go, oh, my Lord. Oh my what am I getting involved with here? That's what I realized. This is a really deep cat. And then when he would come to play, it was the same kind of intensity. He'd look at you, and you would hear the sound coming out. But on his face would be almost no emotion just to look at you with his eyes. And you'd hear the sound roaring, but you couldn't detect it in his face. He'd play those types of he'd do those type of things to kind of just make you do do something that you wouldn't you wouldn't normally do. Yeah, I, I so, mean, yeah. I, I mean, I have lots of things I can talk about when it comes to the, that, this great master. Oh, you know, you're weaving the you're, no. And I, I was going to ask you, you know, your dad was a drill sergeant. Yeah. The perfection was was mandatory in the Walden household. Um, <laughs> did did McLaughlin help you let go? Of some of that stuff, or was it Shree as well? Because I mean, as far as the water dripping, where you're like, "Oh my God, is there water? Is there water dripping somewhere?" You know, you're, you're concerned about these these tangential things that are not relevant to the to the music. Did did they help you just let some of that stuff that you were always getting harangued about as a kid? 
Funny enough, my vision, I think, was raised in a very similar way. Yeah. His father was very intense with him, too, which is, I think, why we could relate with each other so much. Cheech and Moy was also very intense. Sweet, kind, but his, his path was like taking a jet to God. Can you explain Very that? Intense. Can you explain that again? I, you got to go through that. The jet to God. Tell, explain. Yep. Guru Shichin Moy's pathway. You know, there's different ways of going to God. One's hopping in a boat. One's taking a train. One's walking along a, a, a bed of flowers. There's different roads to, of going to, to get to God, or to get to where you open your heart and realize God inside of you. Mm-hmm. Guru's path was called love, devotion, and surrender to, to God. But in saying that, every day he wanted to see you two or three times a day. It'd be in the morning, working out, running three or four miles a day, playing tennis. Then it'd be an afternoon if you're around. Then it'd be an evening function where you were called upon to learn and memorize ten songs in a foreign language, Bengali, and and sing those songs by memory that night. Wow. So the the intensity every day was really really something that I was not ready for at all. But then, having said that, the guru would say to me. Do not compete with Billy Cobham or any other drummers. You will fail. You compete with yourself. Be the best of yourself. And give all judgment to God. Because some night you may think, oh, I'm really good. But God may say, you know, you're okay. Other night you may think, oh, I really wasn't very good tonight. But, but, the, but the Lord from the highest standpoint may say, tonight was your very best. So give up any form of judgment. And that helped me so much going forward playing with my Vishnu and with Jeff, like anybody in my life, was not to judge myself. Because like a lot of musicians afterwards, oh, tonight it wasn't any good. Oh, tonight it was. But I, I, I surrender all that and just feel it. I offer it to God. So it's in, in, in a lot of ways, it's don't, don't internalize or perceive your performance. It's already predestined. I mean, God is already the one looking at you. And don't judge. Don't don't be hard on yourself. Just don't. That's ju- right. Just do your best to open up and let God come through. Do your very best and leave it. Because, for example, you may think, "Oh, I wasn't very good tonight." But in fact, in the audience, someone could have experienced that and felt like this is transforming for my life. This will help me stay alive. What I've heard tonight. That's that happens a lot yeah. in, the, in, in, the, in our world. Yeah, so we have to just give up any form of judgment and just offer it to God. Yeah, no, it's so interesting because I think that I've read stuff about other pe- you know, other musicians who were, you know, they just felt like they played terribly and people came up or they knew they played. You know, that's the difference, though. If you know you don't play well, can you still? Yeah, but see, but there again, what there again, if you're judging yourself, you can fall short because yeah. you not playing well to yourself could be illumining beautiful to someone else right, 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 right. and that's what you're there for is to, is to touch the heart of someone else that not just only yourself you do the very, the very best you can but it's funny how it works you know uh, let's keep touching hearts we got another uh, another tune here for Narda and, uh, and we'll come back and break it down okay okay welcome back inside the studios KEVT Power Talk 12 10 a.m. Um, Narda what do you got for us Oh, that's a fun piece on my first solo album. Uh, the piece is called The Sun is Dancing. Uh, on the guitar is the freshest watermelon. We call him Raymond Gomez. <laughs> He's a hot shot man. He's got that rare gift. He saved my life after the Mavish Orchestra ended. I could put my hope in him to have a, a, a new sound, and I'm very happy I, I know Ray Gomez. On the keyboards is another genius named David Sanchez, who plays wonderful organs and synthesizers and everything you need, and also blazing guitar. And on the bass is another genius from Miami, Florida, and living in New York, named Will Lee, who you've seen on that David Letterman show. Oh, sure. No, I, I want to, the only, listen, it's really interesting because when I connected with Narda through a, a dear friend, um, I was in a goodwill, as I often am, and I was searching the record bins, and I find this album with you in these in the fully adorned white, you know, cloth uh, 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 wardrobe, and I bring I, I bought the record, and I this sun is dancing song, I mean I I dance with my daughters to it almost every day. And it, and, and <laughs> That's cool. It's, no, and, and the thing is, man, because. It, it's haunting, and then it just... I mean, we were just listening to sort of like this deep pocket groove. It wasn't that complex music, but it just... And my question is, you know, how important is it in your mind to have all the musicians playing 
in this at the same time I know there's I know that there was overdubs in the 70s and stuff like that but the idea of just just cutting it with the group in the room how important is that very what you're hearing on this piece that you've just played is live in Atlantic Studios in New York the hallowed studio where Aretha recorded and Ray Charles recorded and all that with the great Tommy Dowd co-producing and helping to engineer with Jimmy Douglas and, and also the great engineer Dennis Mackay in that wonderful room. And this is live. So when you ask that kind of question to me, I say it's, it's, an, it's, it's incredibly important to be surrounded with people who are better than you, that can inspire you and push you. And when I played that piece of music right there, now that piece we had, we had worked on prior, that was, that was a piece I had written and put, put together as a demo to get signed. And Epic at first passed on me, but then it was Atlantic that actually picked up on me. Hmm. And then to go and cut it again is what you're hearing here was just so much fun and completely live. But we would rehearse it, so we knew we, were going to, we went to the studio to cut it. We were ready to, you know, to cut it. But every little thing you're hearing is all live, so I love that aspect. It's wonderful. Yeah. How, how, did you, uh, how did you link up with, uh, with Joe Zawino? Uh, came came time around um, late seventy six or seventy six. No, no, hold on, hold on a second. Seventy seven, maybe. Okay, okay. Yeah. seventy seven. Around there, Mavishnu had had, had 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 wrapped up. I did a recording with Tony Bowling called "Marching Powder." Sure. And then I got a call to come and do a thing with Weather Report, and I did. It was a piece called "Black Market." And then they asked me would I join the band, and then they asked would I bring a bass player because Alfonso Johnson was leaving the band. I said, I'm not sure I can join because I may want to go and play more on the rock side now with Tommy, Tommy Bowling because I wanted a rock experience after playing so much fusion with Ma Vishnu and all that. Mm -hmm. I kind of wanted girls throwing their panties and all that on the stage and having just fun that way. I wanted to relax my mind a minute. But the truth is, I, I said, but I know a bass player for you. I thought of Jaco Pastorius. Sure. And, Jaco, and Joe says, I think I've heard of him. We flew him in the next morning from, from Florida. We recorded a piece called Cannonball. And Cannonball was Jocko's audition. And we played it together. It was beautiful. And then Joe, in the middle of the thing where Jocko was overplaying, Joe told him, don't play that, that stuff on my song. It really made Jocko focus and not overdo it. And Jocko joined the band and became Jocko Pastorius on Heavy Weather. And then I went on with Bowen's band to tour with Bowen. So, but uh, Joe taught me so much in that short time. Joe was a boxer. Joe loved Wayne Shorter. Joe would say, when I want to, you know, make Wayne happy, I go in my garden, I dig out of the black earth these, t these potatoes, and I give Wayne potatoes. <laughs> then I know Wayne's going to be, a, you know, happy with me, and then he'll play, you know. So I got all these kind of stories going down. Well, well, so he, he, I mean, literally, he'd he give him potatoes? Yeah. So much so that years later, I was honored in Japan in the year 1995 as Super Super Producer of the Year. And I wanted to bring to Japan all, all my hot shots. And I asked Joe if he'd come. And he said, yeah, he would. But then he kind of, at the, toward the end, toward the time of going, he got cold feet. So I sent him potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and when he got some potatoes, he said, okay, man, all right, okay, okay. So then we ended up, we ended up going to Japan and then killing it over there. Oh, it's phenomenal to play with Joe Zamo. I'm enough, just phenomenal. And he, I learned little tricks. When it comes time for his solo, when he wants to play his synthesizer solo, he needs me to be on the ride cymbal. I can't stand high. He doesn't want that. He wants that ride cymbal ringing, and then he can fly. So I've learned different intricacies that each person needs to, to, to really get off, you know. Did you ever, uh, um, I know that some of the cat, some of the members of the Grateful Dead have used Tarpan Studios to record, but did you did you ever come across Billy Kreutzman or Mickey Hart from the Dead? Yeah, I know Mickey. Mickey brought his music over here to play for me different times. He's a sweet cat, and Bob Weir is a real close friend of mine. He's recorded here with us, and I do a lot of shows where he'll come and jam. We, we do a great version of, of um, All on the Watchtower, and we do a great version of... Uh, Turn on, turn on, turn on your love light. Oh, that is... Uh, Bobby's over there what, playing rhythm guitar, and you're you're playing Dylan tunes? Y yeah, yeah, he's really something, and he likes... And Bobby will... I've learned over the years of playing with him, especially if we're playing live, he, if it's a long session, long thing, he'll look back at me and say, 
what would Elvin do? And then I immediately go into Elvin Jones gear, and then he loves that. Hold, what, what, do you, what, what live context did you guys have you guys played in? Uh, just here locally the, at the Sweet, uh, Sweetwater and the Dockmorton Theater, and then in the city there was a big gathering. A couple times we've done gatherings in the cities for different 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 things. Because we, we live right here together, so we're, I'm always bopping into him. And then just down the street from my studio is Phil Lesh's joint. So we're, they're all right around this neighborhood. Have you played with Phil before? Never actually played with Phil. Wow, that was... But, but he's a sweet man. Oh, he's a beautiful man. No, I, you know, in, Narda, uh, we've covered some today. I just well, I want to finish by asking you uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, how has... Uh, you know, I, I became a father at 20... Five, but uh, how has fatherhood changed you? Dramatically. I, I, I've always heard that having children would be a big to-do. I had no idea. My daughter, Kelly, completely stopped my life and blew my mind wide open. How? I had no idea it would be... I would, I would feel what I, what I feel. Hmm. I had no idea it would be so life-altering. Now I have a second little daughter. She's five months old. Kelly's 18, 19 months old. And Kayla is five months old. And they, they both just stopped my heart. I can't believe these, these, these little girls. And I can't believe what I feel looking at them and being around them. And how they inspire me. In fact, my new album cover, Kelly's on the cover with me. And the album is called Evolution. Mm. So I'm working on it to be out this year. So I'm, I'm just completely blown. Yeah, it's going to get, you know, it's going to get even more. I think humbled is the next word you're going to find in your dictionary. <laughs> humbled, yes, of course. <laughs> but as okay. they get older, I mean, you know, they start to see you for who you are, you know, and they and they really see you, all your imperfections, and they also love you. And it's like, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, but the thing is that uh, for you to have all this creation on your palate already uh, and then to have children is interesting. For me, the ch my children were the were the impetus and the antecedent to get into my creative career. So it's... One thing for you, in a minute, give me your concept of love, how you bring love to the world every day. I just, I'm very happy uh, to wake up. My grandma taught me that if you open your eyes, that, you know, you give gratitude for opening your, opening your eyes because there are others in the world that have, we're not lucky enough to even open their eyes. So my grandma Nelly is always on my heart with that kind of a phrase. So I'm always, if I wake up in the morning, which I do, then I'm happy I woke up, man. Then I can go from there. And usually I'm waking up now because I'm hearing the strains of my baby crying, wants some, wants some attention, and I run in and like, you know, it's an emergency to help them and be there for them. And that's some less love to me. I'm also really big on social media, of my Facebook and my fans and my people I talk to. In the morning, I want to give them a, a, my message, my, day, my message for the day or inspiration for the day or something even funny. Like right now, I want to do my little love boat. Uh, I'm gonna do like anybody wants to, wants to participate in the contest. Pretend you're gonna be on the love boat show and show me how you're gonna be like you know the special guest artist. And then I'll send them a pair of drumsticks and I'll send them my my, my books and my albums as a, as a contest winner. Hey. I'm just always doing things that are very loving to me, kind and respectful to kind of get through life in a in a wonderful way. And then really, I'm I'm very much aware of God. I'm very much aware that God wants me to have fun. God wants me to make make sure I'm digging the hippopotamus. Digging the gorillas, um, you know. Digging, talking to you. Uh, you know, you remind me of Sting. You got Sting's energy kind of coming through. I dig Sting. I know Sting walks on the water, man. See, so I'm I'm really a fan of life. I'm a fan of digging, of being able, of being able to be here. That I can say, yeah, man. I know Jimi Hendrix's music. I can go and play for you a rare piece of music right now called Jam Back at the House that he played at Woodstock. A lot of folks don't even know that piece, but it is incredibly heavy. Narda, we got to we got to go to a hard break, man. I I I hope you enjoyed this. We'll do I want to do another another at least another <laughs> segment. Okay, man, thank you. All right, many blessings. Blessings. All right. This is the Jake Feinberg show. We'll see you all in a little bit after having to undergo a second surgery on his right foot. In tennis action earlier this morning, Contum stand up. Serena Williams defeated Gabinia Magarutha at Wimbledon in straight sets to win her second Serena Slam. It's her sixth Wimbledon title and her 21st major championship. I'm Kevin Figger. Turn it up. The one is on. Fox Sports 1. We go. America's new sports network. Go to FoxSports1.com to find the channel number for Fox Sports 1 in your area. Let's go online. 
Steve Hartman. Before we get started today, here's your update. Brady Papinga. This is what's sort of inside my soul right now. I'm out of my, out of my mind. Yeah. Hartman. No, no. Papinga. To answer your question there, yes. Your sports. Your topics. I'm going to lose it here. All for you, the fan. Oh, baby. The Here's Steve Hartman and Brady Papinga. Hour number two with Hartman and Papinga here on the Fox Sports Radio Network. Hope your Saturday's going great. Ours is, every Saturday is great here, 877-99 on Fox. That's the number to call if you get the urge to call us. 877-996. 